So I've got, as far as I'm concerned, this is a super exciting little modification that I want to do to this pickup truck. And it's not a really expensive one either. So this is something a lot of guys that are in the same camp as me, got an old pickup truck, car, whatever, you can do this for yourself. Now up to this point, I have been tuning this thing just by eye, by ear, by foot, by feel, right? By the seat of my pants. I think that it runs pretty good, but I don't know, really, right? I don't have any numbers to go by. I'm just guessing at the moment. Reading spark plugs, right? Smelling exhaust gases. Just guessing, I don't, I don't know. I think it's okay, but I don't know, right? Not an expert. Anyway, if you are too rich, I'm running, like, I've got it adjusted where, or jetted to where this thing's dumping more fuel into the engine than what it really needs to run optimally. It's costing me a ton of extra money because fuel's not cheap. It's potentially washing out the cylinders, causing excessive engine wear, on and on and on. Valve and spark plugs, not a good thing to be too rich on the fuel side, fuel side of things anyway. On the other side, too lean, that can cause engine damage itself. Can cause a lean burn, detonation, on and on and on, spark plug fouling, just not good to be either one. Engine damage on either side. So we wanna minimize that chance by installing something that will help us get this carburetor a little more dialed in than what you know my eyeballs and my ears can uh, do on its own. So let me show you what I picked up. I think you'll find it interesting. So what I'm about to install on this truck is a Close Shift brand wideband air fuel ratio gauge. Now I picked this up just like anybody else would off the internet, not a sponsored thing. And the reason, or the way that I justified the expense of this, a couple hundred bucks, so not super cheap, not super expensive, depends on your finances really, is that it won't take long in either way, too rich or too lean, for this thing to pay for itself. 200 bucks in fuel is not that much fuel these days. So if I'm running too rich, Right? I'll save money on fuel. This thing will pay for itself. If I'm running too lean, I could cause costly engine damage. 200 bucks won't even buy the gaskets for this truck. So one way or another, good idea to be able to monitor how this engine's running. Now, this is a single bank wide band O2 Bosch oxygen sensor. I picked the analog version gauge. You can get a digital gauge, but I didn't want to see that bouncing around constantly. So in this truck, we went with the needle type analog. Also comes with a weld-in bung and all of the other you know, bits and bobs that you need to get this kit installed. So let me show you what all this kit comes with and we'll start installing it in the truck. So like I showed, obviously it's gonna come with the oxygen sensor. It's a Bosch brand, right? Nice looking O2. Comes with a gauge, whether you want the digital or the analog, comes with a weld-in bung and a plug, right? So if you want to take the O2 sensor out and just plug it, right, you can do that. Also came with all of the mounting hardware that that you need, right? A pod, right? so if you want to mount this right below the dash or whatever, come with a, uh, I don't know, one that you can mount like on the pillar, like uh, up, hello Cora, like up on the side, beside the windshield, come with that. Also came with all of the stuff needed as far as wiring. A lot of wires in this kit, actually, because you can data log with this as well. So that's pretty neat to be able to, to do all that. You don't have to log data, but you can, right? Comes with a gauge foot, you know, gauge backing, right? Some sticky tape and all that stuff. Pretty much anything you're gonna need to get this thing installed and operating. So personally, I think a bunch of gauges inside of a vehicle that you drive all the time that are mounted everywhere, I think it looks a little tacky. Now, if it's a race car, race truck, whatever, you know, that's a different story. But something like this truck, I don't want a bunch of gauges mounted everywhere. So I'm going to try to mount this in a way that's factory-ish type. So I'm going to try to delete the analog clock that I've got in my gauge cluster and put this in its place. This gauge is... A little over two inches, two and a sixteenth or something like that, 51, 52 millimeters. So I think that I can, you know, butcher up my gauge cluster and mount this in place of the, the old clock that's there, make it look factory type. Oh. 
So because I've chose to mount this gauge in my original cluster, it's just going to take a lot more time. But I'll argue that it'll look a lot better, be a lot more convenient in this area than it would be on a pod down here, you know, scratching your ankles or up here on the dash or, you know, up here on the windshield pillar. I think it'll just look better if I can put it in here. And in the future, I do plan on up dating these gauges in the same method that I'm going to attempt to do with this one gauge here. So that's why I'm going through this effort. It'll look better, I think. Okay, another. There we go. All right. Gauge cluster. So here's a look at our factory gauge cluster. This thing is in really poor shape. Now this is the fuel gauge version. They sell, they had these, and I've had a couple trucks where the tack was here. It had a factory tachometer here, and then the fuel gauge was just a small little gauge over here on the side. Now this one is in, it's just in horrible shape, and that's why I don't mind hacking it up. It needs a new circuit, printed circuit board. This one's bad. All of the places where the gauges, the little connectors here, they're all rusted up. So I've had to hack those to where I can get a good connection and they'll work. So, you know, we're not losing anything by hacking this up. Now, I plan to put this gauge, if I can, in this position here where the clock's at. So we need to disassemble this thing a bit, see if we can't fit that in there, and make it look halfway decent. So I'm going to do away with the pointer as soon as this thing is a manual transmission. We don't need a reverse neutral drive selector here. Do away with that. And then we can just uh, you know, put a piece of tape, black tape or something over the uh, screen there, or just maybe leave it as is. So I'm just taking advantage of this being a part wipe these gauge faces off. I'll put that on full. So because there's no textbook way that I know of to mount gauges inside of the original cluster, it's kind of a, I don't know about a hack job, but it's kind of one of those things where it's, it's custom and you just gotta make it work. So we could use this original pocket could cut away a little bit of the back there and uh, mount it just like that, right? Cut the back of this away to where we get the depth that we need and cut it in a way to where, you know, it's held in the position that it needs to be in. So luckily we have some things to go by here that'll tell us, you know, if we're right or not. It's going to fit. It's just how are we going to do it? So I think I'm on the right track. Now you could make this as difficult as you know you want to, but really the goal here is simple. All we need to do is get this gauge in a position to where it's not too far out or in and it fits in this cluster. That's it, right? As long as it's secure, that's all that matters because after all the bezels and stuff are on, you're not going to see any of the hackery that you had to do you know, to make that happen. So all I've done is remove the clock. Now, I originally was going to use the bracket that mounted the clock, but it's really not big enough. So what I have decided to do is use this socket that is made to mount this gauge in, and I'm going to mount the socket to the housing of the gauge cluster here. And then, because we had a clock here originally, we've got a fuse 12 volts that's constant, which is what is required, and we've got a ground already there that was assigned for the clock, but we're just going to you know, reassign those wires for here. So we got power already ran. So all it needs to do is mount securely and that's it. So we can use these to get our alignment and our depth. And I think that that's going to work pretty good. Now this is kind of hazy, really need a new one. I'll have to drill a couple holes there as well for the buttons that are on the front of this gauge. But you get the idea. It's going to look pretty good when it's done, and uh, it didn't cost us 1500 bucks.
So I want to show you something that at least some of you have never seen before, and that is a plastic welder. They make these in different shapes and sizes, but all it really is, yes, plastic welding, it is a hot air gun. That's all it is. So we have a heating element inside of this here. It hooks to my airline from my air compressor, right? So this has got an electric cord running through it and air, and it blows hot air out the end. And we can use that along with a welding rod, and they make these in all sorts of different uh, you know, plastics, and we can weld broken plastic together. I mean, it's been around for a very long time, just you just don't see it that often. But it's a great way to fix stuff together. Now, I've got my gauge pod in here, and I just use some hot glue to hold it in place to get it, because it's, it's quicker and easier, and I can do that with one hand. Hot glue to hold it in place, keep it aimed where I want. And now I'm going to go to the back of it, and I am going to plastic weld a portion on here, and then I'll remove the hot glue and plastic weld it all the way around because it's going to be the most secure way. Look at that welding bead. Yeah, looks like crap, but that's okay. Nobody's going to see it. And, uh, you know, I'll get better at it as I go. All right, so I got the bracket, I guess, mounted to the housing. It's not going to win any beauty contests there. Look at that real close. See that? Well, that's the last time you're going to see it because it's behind the gauge cluster and doesn't really matter what it looks like. It just matters that it's, you know, sturdy. Now, this just friction fits into here. So we'll put that. Hopefully it stayed where I wanted it to. I think it did. So we'll slide that in. It's got a little cover on it protect the lens for now. And this, yeah, that looks good. And this, I think that's gonna work. Now I just need to put a hole there where I can get to those push buttons. And that's it, wired up, Bob's your uncle. We got a custom mounted gauge. So now that I've got my gauge mounted where I want it to go, I'm happy with that. Now most people are not going to have to go through all this, right? You're going to put the back on there. You're going to mount it up under the dash or on the top of the dash or maybe up on the window pillar. And you can skip all this nonsense that I had to go through. I just wanted it to fit inside the original cluster and kind of have a custom look. But the part that most people will probably dread is the wiring, right? But it's really straightforward. They give you a nice picture here on how to you know, which plug goes where, right? And they're all labeled, so you can't really plug them into the wrong ones. You know, you need 12 volts and a ground, which we'll have because our clock was here, and it has a wire running directly to that clock that has those two. Probably the hardest part for most folks is going to be welding in the exhaust bung. But, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a little MIG welder, you can make it happen. So there we go. Let's start running some wire and, uh, you know, get it done. So on the wiring of this, you just you can't plug it into the wrong spots. So we've got our analog output. So if we were going to log data, we would use that. We've got our power. So this is going to be our constant 12 volts, 12 volts ground, and our lighting. Then we've got the sensor. Goes in the sensor hole. All of these plugs are different, so they can't go into the wrong spot. And then we got our gauge. And then this end plugs into the other end of the gauge. We hook our O2 sensor into here, right? I mean, it looks complicated, but it's really not.
All right, so as far as our power wires here, we've got a 12 volt switched. We have a 12 volt unswitched, so constant 12 volts, only 12 volts when the switch is on. Then we have a lighting 12 volt uh, wire here. Now what I'm gonna do is connect these two together because I want the light to be on all the time. Right, when we have a ground. So these two will go to a 12 volt switch source. This will go to a constant 12 volts and that goes to a ground and that is it as far as the wiring goes. And then you just plug this into the sensor after you get it into your exhaust wherever you're gonna put it. So now it's time to weld in the exhaust bung and it gives clear instructions on what you should do, what's recommended. For one, they don't want you to weld it down low on the bottom of your exhaust pipe. They want it to be 10 degrees up from the center line at an angle. That way any moisture that gets collected in the exhaust doesn't settle and uh, get on the tip of your uh, oxygen sensor. You can see they've got a pretty clear diagram there, you know, about 10 degrees up. And then you also want it back from where all of your pipes collect, probably, what is it, six or 10 inches, something like that. And that makes sense because you don't want to be reading primarily from one cylinder. You want a good mixed sample from all of the cylinders that you're trying to measure, so. So I've got the O2 bung welded on. Now it's time to screw in the O2 sensor. Also uh, hung the exhaust back up. Not the easiest kit to install, right? This not like it's super difficult, but you're gonna have to have a welder and some patience. There we go. Now I just gotta route this in a way where it won't burn up and plug it in. Dun dun dun. Moment of a reveal. Actually, got the gauge installed and I'll show you what it looks like here in just a second. Now I did calibrate this thing per the instructions and I've even taken it out on the road and tried it. I wanted to try to keep this video as tight as I can. You know, give you all the relevant uh, information but yet not, not overload you. I really like its placement. I can see it pretty well. One thing that I'm not crazy about with this gauge is the disco light party that it puts on during startup and during shutdown. I don't think that's necessary for a bunch of flashing and carrying on. You know, I guess if you want to impress a 15 year old, 16 year old at the gas station parking lot with your car, you know, that may be beneficial to you, but I'm not a RGB uh, type of guy. All I want to do, like I said, is see the gauge. So, one good thing about this gauge, or multiple good things about it, is that it, its response time is like immediate. I can see in real time, uh, under varying driving conditions, what my air fuel ratio is doing. This thing responds super fast, and having the ability to see that information is going to give me, it's going to give me the ability to make a real educated decision on what I need to do to this carburetor to get my fuel numbers, you know, more in line with what I think that they should be. So. 
overall, really pleased with the gauge. Installation, not all that bad, although, you know, it's a 5 of 10, I guess. I don't know. The way I did it was an 8 of 10, depending on who you are. Uh, but uh, it works well. Let me, it works really well. Let me show you um, what it looks like in the truck, and then I'll show you some driving footage. All right, so when you first key on, this thing goes through a warm-up stage, so it has to warm that sensor up. You don't have to wait on it, right? You just go ahead and start your vehicle like normal. But this, rega this gauge won't read for like 15 to 20 seconds because it has to be fried chicken. Sorry about that. Radio's on. It has to go through a warm-up stage in order to get an accurate reading you know, on the on the gauge. And you'll see it'll go to, what is it? Uh, yeah, full lean. So anyway, that's what it looks like. And I can change the color, right? It's got 20 different colors. I like, personally, just just the white back and the red needle. But, yeah, I mean, you get the idea. And it remembers those colors, right? If you said it, it doesn't forget that. So let me show you some driving footage, which is kind of hard to show you because it's hard to hold this, uh, the camera, while I'm driving a standard, and, uh, but you get the idea, right? It works. So I'm going to state the obvious here, and that is this gauge doesn't make fuel adjustments for you, right? It just gives you the information that you can use to make those adjustments on your own. So in my case, I've got a Holly four-barrel carburetor with a vacuum secondary. I've got a jet kit here, and after driving this truck uh, in all of its uh, driving conditions, I've actually went up two jet sizes on the primary side of this carburetor and one jet size on the secondary or the four barrel side. I also had 
to or ended up changing the vacuum secondary diaphragm that operates the two extra venturis when you're passing or heavy acceleration. Also changed the spring that works in conjunction with this uh, vacuum secondary diaphragm to fine tune this carburetor in as close to I can, you know, and uh, really happy with the way that that gauge responds. You know, it seems to be good so far. It's a nice quality O2 sensor, and I guess you could say it's a little bit cool. So that's it, you know, better to have the information and, uh, you know, than, than not. One thing that is important is that you don't have any exhaust leaks. You've got a good solid exhaust system, right? You weld that bung in to where there is no air leaks because if you do have air leaks in your exhaust system, you're going to get false readings and, right, you're going to be chasing your tail. So you, the installation of this thing has to be pretty spot on or, right, you're, you're just... You're just not getting accurate info, so not bad. Glad I did it. Uh, like the kit. Can't speak for its long-term uh, reliability because haven't had it long-term, but so far so good. All right, so I guess that's it. Only thing that I wish that I would have done is this sooner than what I have now. Now, this truck was running a little bit lean, not dangerously lean by any stretch, but still it was on the lean side, and I'm glad that, um, you know, I actually have the data to go by now and I'm not uh, guessing like I was before. Now I wasn't necessarily guessing but I was using bits and little pieces of information you know based on drivability, spark plugs, smell of exhaust, the way that it starts on and on and on versus actual air fuel numbers you know from a quality gauge. So that's it I guess. Nice kit. You know I really do like it. Glad I installed it. So that's it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.